fantastic. Thank you so much, Faith. And can everyone hear me? Because I'm doing this double mic can thing. Can hear you loud oh, so and great. Clear. I'm actually going to mute right. so that you can have the floor. Fantastic. All right. My name is Donald Young. I'm a certified community health worker with John Hopkins Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. And I became a um, participant in uh, a community advisor or community leader in research. In 2016, I had the unfortunate incident of losing my mother to the fentanyl crisis in Baltimore. And at the time, I wasn't working in research, wasn't working with community engagement or anything, but it was at that moment that I understood that you know, the city was in, in peril and that fentanyl had struck with such ferocity that it had touched my home. And because it had touched my home, it gave me some interest to work on ways to some, I have to do something. I have to be able to work with somebody to do something because I'd lost my mother. And then shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with a condition that would uh, ultimately certainly changed my life. And it's one that I will live with for the rest of my life. And uh, that's when I really got boots on the ground and find ways to help people that were not just from the LGBTQIA or the underserved African-American population, but in any minority group. And when I learned about uh, patients in it out some research and how much of an interested part community members like myself could play and uh, bringing some type of health equity and disseminate some real uh, concrete information to communities that uh, were filled with people who looked like me, who thought like me and uh, wanted to make a difference. So that's how I got involved in research. That's what brought me to uh, the career that I'm in. And it has um, broadened my, my scope so much that I've recently uh, co-authored uh, an article in the American Journal of Public Health. I submitted abstracts and was uh, presented at uh, annual public health convention. This is a little guy from Partite, um, zip code being 21215. And I always say the zip code because I know that we are researchers and statisticians and we look at numbers and things. So when you look at the zip code of 21215, you'll see just how many disparities the folks who lived in my community went through to make me have a seat here and want to be so vocal and adamant about that we reach, you know, some type of equity or something that even resembles equity in my community and, and for people who look like me and think like me. Thank you so much, Donald. Um, we appreciate that. And uh, so we'll Thank you for, for getting our webinar, setting the tone for that and getting our uh, getting us started today. So um, today's objectives, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to describe how to create a uh, the um, virtual and ad hoc groups and gain feedback to guide continuous engagement efforts. Uh, we're gonna identify communication strategies that support continuous engagement discuss how to find opportunities for community partners to advise on other projects, both internally and externally. And then uh, we're inviting you in the chat to uh, tell us what you might hope to learn today. So looking forward to engaging with you. I also want to take a minute to uh, introduce today's speakers. So we have Joe Harward, which is a lead training specialist at the Patients Program. He's also worked on creating the Patients Professors Academy. He works with the Patients Program partners to create patient mm -hmm. community engaged research. Thank you, Joe. We also have um, Tanisha Armstrong, who is a Patients Professor, Educator, Advocate, and Leader who found health advocacy to truly be the difference between life and death for herself and her loved ones. We have Jenny Flanagan, a patient's professor and registered nurse working as a clinical research nurse coordinator. Jenny actively participates as an advisory member with the University of Maryland through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Network. And then we also, you just heard from a Donald Young, who's a Baltimore City native, U.S. Navy veteran, and certified community health worker. 
She's currently employed by the John Hopkins Institute for Clinical and Translational Research and serves on the board of directors for the Historic East Baltimore Action Coalition. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm going to stop sharing and allow you to share, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Faith, and uh, thank you for everyone for being here. I'm excited to, to learn more about your experience and also share um, some of the work that we do. Just give me one second to move just a couple things around here. Okay. So uh, we are with the Patients Program at the University of Maryland uh, School of Pharmacy in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so a lot of the people we work with are in uh, Baltimore area, but also across the country. Uh, our vision, patients and stakeholders are heard, inspired, uh, and empowered. Oop. Multitude of things and trying to do it all on a, there we go. Uh, patients and stakeholders are heard, inspired, and empowered to co-develop patient-centered outcomes research. The patients program encourages patients, caregivers, and community members to be involved in every aspect of research. Um, when I go out into the community, which is much less than I would like to, um, I tell people that the Patients Program forms a bridge between communities and researchers um, to come up with better healthcare research, research that actually benefits communities. Uh, and we do that through the 10-step uh, the engagement framework. So this is something that our patients professors, our longtime advisors, um, our Patients Program team have come up with. Um, and it's broken into three phases, planning, doing, and delivering. So in the planning phase, we're working actively with patients and community members. What are the topics or research questions that are important to you? Which ones are at the top of mind? Which ones should we be engaging in? And then really framing the question, what are the questions we should be asking? Where should the research agenda be steered rather than me as a researcher saying, I want to study this, we're working with the community and patients to study what is of interest to them, what can uh, benefit them. And, and then in the doing phase, we're thinking about, you know, in patient-centered outcomes research, we're comparing different therapies, different alternatives. We're coming up, you know, uh, what kind of frameworks can we use? How are we going to analyze the data that we collect? And then in delivering, we're, you know, reviewing, interpreting results, you know, what, are, what, is the, what is the data telling us that we're translating what we've learned into plain language, something that we can uh, transmit to our different community partners uh, through dissemination? How are we sharing it? What kind of give backs or infographics or research reports um, can we give back to the community in addition to sharing it more widely um, with our partners, other people like yourselves today that are interested in the work that we do? So, um, so part of this work that we're the, the vehicle that we've used to share the 10 step framework is the, the patients professors Academy. I shared a link earlier that um, takes you directly to the page about the Academy. Um, this summer will be our third cohort. Um, it's a free five week virtual program that brings together patients, caregivers, government representatives, researchers, uh, industry representatives, and others to learn about the 10 step framework. Um, and how they can apply it to their own uh, contexts. The Academy is co-led by patients professors, and the Academy really grew out of this desire to build upon the patients program success and authentically and continuously engaging patients, uh, communities, other stakeholders in conducting patient-centered and community-engaged research. So the purpose statement for um, the Patients Professors Academy, our purpose is to learn from each other how to conduct community engaged health research. Together we advance health equity by transforming how research is done to honor value and incorporate patients and communities lived experiences and advice, respect, dif uh, respect diverse cultural perspectives and acknowledge historical and current research misconduct, protect patients from harm, build trustworthiness by ensuring that patients are integral to research decisions, increase diversity, recruitment, and retention in research participation, share what we learn with patients and the public, and embrace bi-directional learning to improve health and maintain trustworthiness, and provide value for both patient and research communities through mutually beneficial relationships. 
So obviously that's a lot of information. I'll give a, a second here to digest uh, some of that. Um, but we're trying to do a lot of different things through the academy, through really um, hearing the voice of patients and communities, having our patients professors leading the curriculum with our team. So who are patients professors? I've thrown that term around quite a bit already. So they are patients, caregivers, and community leaders who instruct researchers on what's important to patients, how best to engage patients and communities. Uh, Donald mentioned, mentioned a community health workers. You know, how can we engage credible messengers and others who can you know, spread the message, spread information to others in their, their patient communities and their geographic communities? And how and, and patients professors also inform how to translate and disseminate that critical information to patients and communities. So you go through the academy, uh, graduates earn the title of patients professors uh, because they teach us how to be better researchers. So this is a little bit more of the curriculum, you know, really basing it in health equity and um, talking a lot about that 10 step framework. So each week, so as I said, it's five weeks. Each week, there's about four to five hours of content that our participants can engage in. They can learn from other patients, professors, learn from the seminar co-leaders, learn from our team about our experience um, in engaging with patients and uh, communities. And, you know, it's, it's a busy time in the summer. You know, we're, we're doing a lot. And then, uh, you know, we come to graduation and say, congratulations, you have earned the title of patients professor. And now... The, the, the academy's over and that's, and that's it. Um, our engagement continues just when the academy ends. The, the, our, our, I feel that our engagement is, is truly continuous. It's something that we are always working on, always doing. And I really wanna turn it over to um, our, or to, to the patients professors that are on this call to hear from them about their experience. And mainly, um, you know, if you could talk about your experience in the Patients Professors Academy. And I see Tanisha, so I'll go ahead and pick on her. Um, if you could share your experience in the, in the Patients Professors Academy. Good afternoon, everyone. My experience um, in the Patients Professors Academy has been unexpected, but extremely exciting and fulfilling for me. Uh, Patients Professors Academy came across my email somehow. Um, I cannot recall how I became connected at this point. It's become such a natural part of my life. It's just here. Um, I applied, was admitted, and went through the very first cohort. And uh, at the same time, I was just beginning my studies as an uh, MPH student at Emory University. So it fell into place at the perfect time. Um, it has been amazing to meet the other patients professors to continue to be engaged. They are consistently sending us opportunities to engage, not just with the School of Pharmacy, not just with Patients um, Professors Academy, but in uh, different opportunities such as this one to speak about our personal experience. Um, sometimes the most challenging things in our lives can be actually a great resource for us to be able to speak clearly about what our experience is and to change some things for other people. So that has been um, an amazing part of being a part of the Patients Professors Academy, the ongoing engagement and the ability to meet people from all over the world. Thanks so much, Tanisha. Uh, Donald, yeah. uh, can, you, can you share about your experience in the Academy? Yep, I will, Joe. Um, thank you. It, like Tanisha, I was a part of the first cohort for the patient's professors. So there was not really anything for them to, for, to lean back on because it was, it was the first time that, that they were doing it. But this was prior to me even uh, becoming a certified community health worker. It was the patient professors academy that even nudged me to know that there was an opportunity to uh, work in the field as a community health worker. You know, as, as a man, the community health worker field is a predominantly uh, female-led uh, workforce. And to, to be a 6'5", a, a bald, full-bearded African-American gentleman, it came as I was in um, 
anomaly in, in the work field. Not to mention some days I wear skirts and paint my fingernails. So it was, and for my community, it was sometimes met with a little contention. It wasn't always smooth sailing because it, it woke, what the Patient Professors Academy did was put me back into situations where before I would have been inadequate and felt um, ill-equipped to to do the job and, and carry the mantle, but the Patient Professors Academy gave me the reassurance and gave me the, I always like to help, but it gave me the, the resources, the tools, and the access, the access to the researchers who were doing, doing the work that, that I felt needed to be done in the community. Not that I felt it, but what I heard from, from listening to the other people in the community. I said in the chat about the bi-directionality of it because the curriculum with the Patient Professors Academy was not all didactic. It wasn't just a bunch of lectures. When I did it, I didn't even know how to get onto whiteboard. That was one of the barriers, one of the fears that kept me from going to post-secondary when I got out of the Navy because I felt like I was going to be this one guy sitting in this coliseum of, of, of a lecture hall with the professor down in the pit and we all sitting around and I don't even have Wi-Fi because we don't have the money to get the computer. I didn't, I was, the digital divide was huge. It was because of the willingness of Joe and the other folks who were at the patient professors Donald, your audio is cut out for some reason. You yeah, we, we lost you, Donald. There, it's connected. There we are. Can there. you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, great. Okay. Oh, you sound amazing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, but that's what moved me to get into Patients Professors Academy because I was going to be able to have the information to support what it was I wanted to do in the community. That's great. Thanks so much, Donald. Uh, Jenny, would you like to share, you know, uh, your experience with the Academy? Sure would. Um, I'm so apologetic here. I cannot get my video to work. So I'm really sorry for that. Um, I don't know what happened because I could see Faith when I first started and she could see me. Um, nevertheless, I am of the first cohort. I'm an alumni. And um, during my experience um, in the PPA, uh, I was actually under treatment for breast cancer and I was traveling nine hours back and forth from my home to Sloan Kettering and oftentimes on the train when the sessions were going on. And I have to tell you that not only did I love the program just for the content and the interaction and the networking, but I also loved it because it was the best distractor that I had at the time for what I was going through. And I made new friends. I networked uh, and continue to network. I've had opportunities that I wouldn't have had before um, in networking with all of these wonderful people and the team at U of M. And um, I, I really hope that people will jump on, apply for the um, the PPA cohort this year, uh, third year, um, to learn and gain all of the great um, things that we gained from it. As you heard, um, I also find that with the 10-step process, we implemented uh, in my clinical research department, a patient focus group. And, you know, we had a PCORI grant and we implemented that focus group and it was great. And it still continues today. That's why I really want to say that it doesn't just end at the end of the program. It actually is the beginning um, because once you have the 10-step process down, you find that you use it just about everything. And it doesn't need to be, you know, necessarily in healthcare. It can be 
in child rearing. It can be in, you know, doing things that you want to do with any other program. It's a framework that is designed to guide you. And um, so our patients focus group is still going today. And it, it mostly because we stuck with it, but other, the other side of that is the patients on that group won't let it end. They won't let it end. And we get great feedback and we learn so much from them uh, with every design, every you know protocol that we have, clinical research study that we're doing. We're very small and our community is, is, is really um, you know, vast, but small in numbers. We have a huge geographic region and, you know, transportation and such is an issue. So we have a lot of challenges uh, way up here in northern New York. So if you, anybody has any questions, I'll put my email in the chat and, you know, happy to reach out and find out more if you want. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Uh, Donald, you had a comment? I did. First off, can you guys hear me? Yeah. You can? Okay. It was the, the comment that was just made about it can be used in other, can you hear me? It can be used in other forms of, of, your, of my life, not just in patient-centered outcome research. I, I spoke to before in another group that we had about this before. Yeah. It's everything, my communication with my team internally uh, within my job now. The conversations that I have with family members where it's all inclusive, it's not just, um, it's this dictatorship, I get to say what we're doing for summer vacation. Nope, it doesn't work like that. It, because if everybody's going to enjoy themselves, then everybody's got to have some input on where we go, or where we're going to spend our time. And then it just makes for a more robust and enjoyable vacation. And, and it's with this research, when you add the the community into whatever it is that you are attempting to do. I promise you, it is going to make your product better because there are so many thoughts and, and, and ideas that lay within the communities that are underserved. The answers that you're looking for is there in the community. If it means that you have to work with a community health worker to act as that bridge liaison, the, the warm handoff, then so be it. Write that into your, your grant. Write that into the budget. Make deliberate attempts to have community health workers, those trusted messengers, make deliberate attempts to compensate us fairly in the rich work that you're doing. We're seeing the benefits. But we sometimes don't, aren't able to adequately convey it to the community because there are still some little parts that you're not really being 100% transparent with, you know? So if you expect for the community to be authentic and transparent, you have to do the same. You have to be willing to, you know, make the community a part of the, the policy and the, the budget preparing and all that makes the community a part of that because it makes for a, such a strong, more robust program. And these interventions, the, the fact that interventions have the ability to change as, you know, as we go on, when you involve the community in the intervention, those changes aren't as doesn't hit as hard because the community can almost prepare you ahead of time that, hey, this may may happen. Hey, they're really getting tired of getting $25 gift cards. So before somebody starts to send these emails screaming about it, we may want to start to think how we can change that ahead of time. Thanks so much, Donald. Yeah, and <clears throat> I know that some of the objectives today were about continuous engagement. I'm going to share that in just a minute. But also, you know, there's a question that we often get. It's like, well, how do you how do you even get started? How do you how do you engage um, uh, communities? So I and so I I'm going to get to the, some more of the continuous engagement once you've started those relationships. 
But I do want to hear from Tanisha and Jenny and Donald also about how, um, how have you started relationships or how have you brought the community into different practices or how have you connected to different members of your community um, or, or help facilitate that with, with others? And, and Jenny, I, I'd only just pick on you because you just mentioned that patient um, uh, focus group. If you talk about how that came together, how did you build that from scratch? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so we are, uh, like I said, a small rural clinical research department up in northern New York, way at the top of the state. And um, we're like, I, to give you an idea, we're not Buffalo, we're not Rochester, we're right on the Canadian border, just below Ottawa. So um, not many people knew we had a clinical research department unless they were actually referred by a physician um, that knew that we had a trial going on. So as we evolved over the past three years, um, our, our program has been together for six, but as we evolved over the past three years, working with, um, you know, PCORI, University of Maryland, uh, the PPA, um, we started to look at a po patient focus group um, and we recruited various members from the community. And we, we have four colleges in our area. So we do have more of, a, of an ethnic base. And so we found that we could actually find people of color and um, you know, low socioeconomically disadvantaged people um, and those that do have like academia um, and or professional jobs that were willing to sit on in and on panels to discuss what was going on uh, with clinical research. So they helped us uh, once they were chosen to be on this panel and they meet monthly, they helped us spread the word on our clinical research department in our community. Um, not only in our community, but in our own hospital community, whereby if I went to any given department, I could ask a nurse or a housekeeper or you know, a maintenance man, um, do you know about our clinical research department? And they'd say, well, we don't have that here. And it, so mm -hmm. these patient advisors, um, focus group advisors were so helpful in helping us spread the word. Here's how you can do it. Here's who you need to talk to. And I, I always tell this story because the funny side of this is we ended up at the farmer's market and every week throughout the spring to fall, because up here we have snow, so we don't have farmer's market in the snow time, but for every week for the summer, um, you know, spring, summer and fall, early fall, we are at the farmer's market. And we have a table with clinical research, our staff and a patient who's experienced our clinical trials. And um, it's been a fantastic outreach program because we have a lot of people that participate in our farmer's market. And uh, so we got some leverage with that. And these, um, these, this focus group, they, you know, come from their perspective, we're meeting them where they're at and you know the conversation, like Donald said, is bi-directional. You know, we share with them what we do, and they share back how it could be better from the patient's perspective. And that is vital. I, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Is it okay. Jenny here? I, I, I don't know if you want to share kind of the, uh, the experience that you have had of, of kind of starting relationships with, with other patients, with communities, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as, as Jenny was talking, I was thinking about a task force that developed in our area during the pandemic. Um, it was about survival initially, really about making sure that some of the underrepresented um, members of our community, um, disenfranchised members of the community were getting PPE. We have a lot of poultry processing plants in our area. I live in an odd little place that is rural, but I live in the largest city on the Eastern shore. So um, it started as a task force. It started as a partnership with some agencies and with the health department and with the local hospital system. And it grew into each one 
bring one. Uh, so we started to call the people that we knew that were serving these communities and serving different individuals whose faces we were not seeing, who we knew had the need, uh, but who also had the reach. And um, everyone had an equal voice at the table. No one was more important because they came from a different agency. No one got to monopolize the conversation. Um, and we also formed partnerships and friendships and a referral network that didn't exist before. We realized some services were overlapping. We realized where some yeah. gaps were. As Donald yeah. talked about the importance of community health workers, um, we realized that they were the ones who were in people's homes or being stopped on the street or who were doing that sort of outreach that Jenny talked about at the farmer's market or at the grocery store in the parking lot at the poultry processing plant. So we did all that we could to connect people uh, and then to encourage voice. And I think that that was one of the biggest things, encouraging voice and allowing people to be heard, um, letting them be understood that they could that they were being heard, whether they were happy with what was going on or not. And, and if they were not happy with what was happening, they had a right to say why and what needed to be changed. And I think that has been huge. And I continue to see that um, moving forward. Phone calls, I was in a meeting today, a conversation about a group of agency representatives and a presentation and um, that started another line of, of thinking and another potential project. So I think it really is about making sure that we work our connections. Meeting people in PPA has been amazing. I invited a friend, um, told her about my experience, chatted and she uh, enrolled in the second cohort of PPA last um, the year. So mm -hmm. I think it really is about a personal connection, but also recognizing that um, we may be a bridge uh, even if we are not involved uh, or if we're not drawing someone into the project that we are particularly working on. It's funny that you say that Tanisha about being the bridge even if we're not working particularly on the project and our name doesn't end up in the byline or in the credit. I see a lot of times that in, in this type of work, folks do what's called information hoarding or resource hoarding, where you, know, you make the connection with the organization and then they feel like every other connection that's made with anybody else, it has to come through you or at least with you as a CC on the email and that's necessarily not the case and sometimes you may tarnish the relationship with both parties when you try to hover so closely to to what, what what's happening now i know it is important to make sure that whoever you connect whoever i connect with researchers i do want to make sure that the researcher is going to come back and disseminate the findings that's one of the only things that i really and ten toes down on is that you have to promise me that you're going to come back and disseminate the findings. So uh, one of the things that, that I can speak of about starting and implementing, Joe, is that um, when I started in this work, it was with SEAL, the Community Engagement Alliance, to fight disparities uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, the testing, the vaccination, and, and that sort of thing. So it was what we were hearing in the barbershop. If you get your child vaccinated, then they could become sterile. Um, if you get vaccinated, um, you may experience as a man erectile dysfunction. You know, there were a bunch of uh, myths that... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, you heard the screen. Somebody else is in the office, but so, you know, we we learned early on that that we learned early on. We learned early on that um, it could, you know, we could talk to people and get vetted information if we listened to what the community questions were, and then we found infographs and we put those infographs on a call trip. So the community could reach out uh, to this Qualtrics survey 
find vetted information from CDC, NIH, other vetted sources, they can order up to 200 copies of that information, and then we send it directly to the community-based organization. So that was our way of responding immediately to whatever myth that the community had. And now we're working on a health uh, monitor, health information monitoring system called I Heard Baltimore, where we're asking community, 200 panelists throughout Baltimore City, have you heard certain information? So have you heard that there's been a rise in RSV cases in Baltimore City? If you heard it, you say yes. If you didn't hear it, you say no. But if you heard it, we want to know where you heard it from, if you trust that information. And that is how we're getting a gauge of what's being said in the community and we're responding immediately to it. We heard that the CDC may have new guidelines regarding um, COVID isolation if you tested positive. And this ran rapid for about three weeks until a CDC person came into the I heard meeting and said, wait, we're not having that meeting. That's not a conversation that's being had. But we had heard this on, you know, news, vetted news sources that we usually believe for our, for our information. So it is important, I've learned, that it's important to stay connected so that as a community health worker, I can almost immediately disseminate with the, the fact cited sources to back up what's being said, not just willy-nilly off the top of my head. Well, Donnie said, nope. I go to the trusted sources and I try to get uh, information from you all. The reason, you guys are the folks that the community trust. The researchers, they, they see me, they trust me. They would take a hail off of my cigarette in the middle of a pandemic. So they trust me. They want to see the researchers, the ones who are on that byline that says the principal investigator is, you know, the, who, who's the PI? Who's the co it's great now that our group now, we have a community co-PI, a gentleman by the name of Roger Park, who is really trusted in the community, but, you know, he's, he comes out of that dome to come down to the resources. You know, you'll see Dan Mullins at a, a Dr. Mullins at a resource fair or at a web, at a seminar that's in person outside shaking hands with the folks coming in. That's huge in the community to have an a, a, a individual from that stature because we look up to the white coat in my community. Just, you know, we, we look up to you guys. So we would love to see so much more researchers in the in the community and you sure they want to see me but they want to see you too uh, donald you bring up a lot of um really good points and jenny i'll get to you in just a second but of the um of meeting people where they are and really listening i this i the i heard baltimore is a really a fascinating project of trying to figure out where information misinformation is coming from and trying to address it fast but, but like I said, that listening, that listening is very important. And as a someone that's working with researchers that's interested in like, I want to engage this community and he's saying like, this is what I want to do. I want to engage this community in this trial in whatever this initiative might be. And if you're not listening, you're not going to hear what the community actually needs in that moment. There, there was someone we were working with last summer in the academy that said, you know, we were in Mississippi and we were trying to recruit for um, a drug trial or some other kind of trial. And that's just when the Jackson, Mississippi water crisis was going on. And people are like, well, we don't, we can't care about that. We're really concerned about the water. And, and I, in that discussion is like, well, that's a great opportunity for you to say, all right, let's see what we can do. What resources can we give to do that thing? And that starts to build that trust that down the line, you know, a lot of it is, a lot of this engagement, continuous engagement is patience because you're, you know, and I'm gonna show a graphic in a little bit about this relationship cycle. You're, you're starting that to cultivate that and it takes time before you get to, I want you to advise on this research. I want you to help me recruit for this trial. It, it takes, it needs to take a while to get there because you need to build that trust. Um, Jenny, you got a comment? 
Yes, um, I want to share with you that I just went to a conference uh, two weeks ago for the American Hospital Association, and um, I had never been. And there was a breakout session that I had had visited, and it was a a successful story. It was very interesting, and it was a big. I won't say the the university or the state, um, but it was a big university hospital that had worked with a rural hospital to provide services, much like we're all doing now is like systemizing. But, um, you know, they they gave great presentation related to access to care and all of this. And at the end, they opened it up for questions. And so my question, now that I've been in the PPA and my focus is is very much on the patient's voice, it was before, I'll preface it with that. It was before, but now more and more and more. Uh, I raised my hand and I said, did you have patients on your panel as a focus group to have a voice, to say what they felt would be beneficial to them, whether it be services or timelines or time that their office hours are, et cetera, et cetera. And I left, I rendered them without a voice. They just looked at each other. These two speakers just looked at each other and they were like, you could tell that they were trying to figure out what to say. And they didn't. They they did not have a patient's voice on on you know their panel to discuss this. And it was successful. That's great. But how would they know if they didn't ask? And that was a big takeaway that I had for that. I had an aha moment and I um you know, now I ask at every plenary session, where's the patient's voice in your project? So. Thanks, Jenny. No, that's a great example. Tanisha? So one of the things that Donald said that I wanted to follow up on was um, we can't assume that we know where people are getting their information, uh, and but we need to know one, what information they've received, but we also definitely need to know where it's coming from. I think that sometimes when we're sitting around a table making decisions, we forget to ask where we got our information. So we can make some decisions about things. One of the things that we learned was that a lot of information during COVID about vaccinations and all the things that Donald talked about, we're, we're going through WhatsApp. But our conversations around the table initially were about using Facebook or Twitter um, or making flyers. Uh, but people were saying to the community health workers, um, send me a message on WhatsApp, send me the information on WhatsApp. Uh, and so we were assuming a thing and about to run with it until we were told like, you can do that, but instead of chasing your tail, you might wanna do this. So I think it is really important to consider the mantra that um, many of us have heard about assuming. It's not a good thing and it's definitely not a good thing in public health. No, Tanisha, that's, that's great because I, I feel, you know, in, in other work that I've done is like, well, we're gonna use this particular vehicle. We're gonna do it this way. And then if you interrogate that, you ask, well, why are we doing it this way? It's like, like, I don't know, it's the easiest or it's one I've heard of before. This is the way we've always done it. Instead of really asking, why are we going to use this particular way to engage? And if, it may not work. It, it may not it may not be successful. Um, I we wanna, get that all one time. Go ahead, real quick, Joe. Joe, we get that all the time because this is the way we've, all, we've always done it. That This is, Donald, this is a a trusted uh, evidence-based tool that's worked before, and we know that this works. Yes, it works to render those results that you got, but if you want, if you're looking for different results, if you want to take that deeper dive, you have to open things up a little differently because, you know, and, and a 12 second job long to, if you Doing the same things, expecting different results is simply insane. And if this is a, um, a, a evidence-based tool that worked before, it worked to get you the results that you got. If you're looking for different results than you got the last seven years you did this, you're gonna have to try something different. You can't use that same 
model that same um it it just doesn't work it it it, it just doesn't it or it would work it works so much better when when you use a 10 step approach and you're not not to harp on the 10 step but i'm just saying it works <laughs> it works yeah tanisha and I think one of the things, there's a distinction between why aren't people engaging and why won't people engage. So sometimes they aren't engaging because we're not reaching them and we are acting like it is something that they're doing to us when we're not realizing that we are not reaching them. So there is a difference there and it's important to acknowledge that sometimes we're not getting the results we want because we're doing something wrong. That's a really fascinating distinction of, of aren't is that they're just not hearing it versus won't where you haven't built the trust that even if they are receiving it, they're, you know, they, they the, the, the trust has not been built. The engagement has not been built for them to want to receive that. So that's a really interesting distinction. I wanted to share something really quick, um, a little bit more um, about the continuous engagement. When we talked about that the, the uh, Patients Professors Academy ends we do a weekly newsletter where we share um, other things that are happening in the news, other opportunities for um, patients, professors to stay engaged. Um, to Donald's point, you know, we we take all of the information that we got, all the feedback, you know, where people are are coming from, um, you know, how they identify as like patients, caregivers, healthcare providers. We do that summary report of the academy and share that with all of our participants. Um, in October, we uh, so a couple months after the um, academy ended, we did a homecoming where people come back and say, what are the particular topics you want to work on? Do you want to talk more about um, working in disability spaces or patient advocacy or how to craft your message? And then we use a survey to refine, you know, what were those particular things? And we came up with a few different uh, workshops, interest groups, similar, um, I think, to what Jenny was talking about. And uh, give me one second to try and find this thing here. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to share, um, I mentioned this. So this is something that I learned from a mentor of mine, the um, relationship cycle. I know that you know we're all, we're all in relationships all the time and sometimes it's kind of automatic. I feel like this, I feel like this really helped me. And I think it can really help when you're working with communities is that there's a lot of tendency to go directly from I found a community, I really need something from them. And I need them to invest in, in what I'm doing. I need them to sign off on a, a grant or I need them to participate in this trial. But I feel that if, you, if you're able to take the time of identifying, starting that communication, start to cultivate the things that that community is starting to ask what they really want, what's really important to them, then you can get to that investment. You can get in that, that stewardship where both sides are actually uh, working together on a common goal. Um, stop share. And then um, let's see, we had a couple comments from, from our speakers, but, but yeah, and I think uh, when we talk about how we've created continuous engagement opportunities, um, our, so the patients program, their, uh, we have a steering committee that is made up of more community members than patients program representatives. So, so that gives them actual decision power into how the patients program actually does the work that they do, what research we pursue. And also um, inviting, uh, inviting people to uh, participate in, so Tanisha, Jenny and Donna were in the first wave of the Patients Professors Academy, we invited them you know, to help uh, contribute to the next year, to act as facilitators, to provide insight on our admissions, our uh, purpose statement, and also trying to find any other opportunities that where they can speak and share their information. So Tanisha spoke at the National Health Council last year about um, the importance of, you know, telemedicine to her and that, that, that kind of push and pull and the potential of that. Um, and as uh, my colleague Hillary Edwards mentioned, mentioned, Jenny spoke at a recent conference um, about healthcare access, and Donald has been very active working with us and sharing his experience with continuous engagement. Um, 
I'd really like to say I really appreciate uh, Tanisha, Donald, and Jenny for taking their time to get today, and Faith uh, giving us the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, you can definitely find out more information on that uh, on that website, but I'll turn it over to Faith, and I really appreciate uh, all of your attention today. Great. I, I just wanted to say um, thank you all as well, and I know many of you on this call have um, or on this webinar joined us for part one. I just want to emphasize that. Um, they're not, they're complementary, uh, not necessarily uh, required to do both. So if you are just joining us and you missed the first half, then, um, or the first presentation, which was um, January 30th, you can find it on our YouTube channel. And uh, when I send out the link to the, uh, all the attendees that actually will have the recording, then you'll be able to, to find that if you meet that tier. I am putting in um, the chat our evaluation link. Uh, we ask that you uh, send that, uh, please complete that. It is how you get your MLA credit. If you're here for MLA credit, if you're here for chess credit, you'll be getting that as well. But I um, also just wanted to say thank you all um, to the Patients uh, Academy and professors. Uh, we've gotten some real good comments from the part one that how useful it was. Um, we, we would have loved to take people off of mute and have them engage, but unfortunately we, we don't have that um, bilateral direction here. Um, but, uh, you know, we do invite you to use the chat if you need to. Um, uh, yeah, there was an evaluation for part one earlier. Um, if you did not can send it out. So uh, no worries to that. Um, and again, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, we do have a few minutes here that you can put them into the chat. But again, I just want to give a, a, a again, a, a thank you to all of you guys for agreeing to do this webinar for us, um, to talk to us more about your experience, about the program, um, about some considerations that um, we need to do when we're engaged in the community. Um, it is, it's just very useful, especially if you're either new to this work or you need a reminder or you're just curious. And um, uh, it, it's, it's very useful to um, all of us that are actually communicating out. We often forget that um, it is it's definitely a partnership and a cooperation and it's not just going and doing research and finding out what you need. So um, again, thank you so much to um, all the patients uh, professors Academy and uh, program and uh, we got like a couple of minutes audience if you just want to you know put in your parting shots um, and and let us know and um, if you guys want to if you're comfortable with putting your contact information I know Donald you put yours in there Jeannie um, Joe if you don't mind dropping the patients uh, program link again so that way people can sign up I believe that uh, when you when they sign up they can or maybe there's an email list they can get on to know when um, the academy is open I often share it out uh, when I see it in the newsletter I send it out to our NNLM um, recipients to let them know that it's open and they can apply and that you're not restricted you don't have to live here in Baltimore obviously or even in Maryland um Jenny's a testament to that. She's in New York. So if you're interested and you're not local, please don't feel restricted by that. So, um, and please reach out. I'm sure that there could any additional information um, that you have or questions about the program. Um, hopefully uh, you can get that answered um, with uh, Joe and our other people. But again, thank you all so much for agreeing to participate. I wish we had more time. You know, we might have to um, think about having to do this again, maybe. Um, in a in a way that people can it's it's worth repeating and thank you all so much for your interest and in actually coming to this webinar and uh, sharing our interest in this particular program so and I'll stop the recording thank you so much Joe everybody. <laughs>